Hello again, everybody. I'm Roger Hoover. Glad to welcome you back to the Crimson Tide Sports Network and welcome to our Thursday edition of Crimson Drive presented to you by Coca-Cola as we cover the latest in Alabama athletics. Our friends at RJ Young have provided us with this smart board that will help us go through the headlines for today's show. And again, RJ Young is the official technology solutions provider of Crimson Drive. Coming up on the show today as we get ready for Alabama's second game of the season against Mercer, we'll have Coach's checklist. We'll hear Coach say who was rather fired up at his press conference last night. That'll be coming up first, and then we'll have our Writer's Row conversation with Mike Rodak, who covers Alabama for AL.com. We'll check in with the voice of the Crimson Tide, Eli Gold, ahead of tonight's Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show that's coming up at 6.30 across the network. And then last but not least, we'll have our interview with Greg Byrne that aired live on the Crimson Tide Sports Network yesterday. But we definitely want to have that for you again because he talks all about what's new at Bryant-Denny Stadium for 2021 and just really gives us a good recap of everything that happened and over the summer in college athletics. What crazy summer it turned out to be. Take a look at more of our headlines, starting with Crimson Tide football team. Again, 1-0 in the season. Really good performance last Saturday in Atlanta against the Miami Hurricanes. Now the Mercer Bears come to town. We'll have a noon airtime kickoff at 3 o'clock from Bryant Vinny Stadium. Alabama leads the all-time series with the Bears 3-0, and that included a win last time they played 56-0 back in 2017. Very good effort by the Crimson Tide in that ball game. And Bryce Young, really good performances by him in the Miami game. 344 yards, four touchdowns. He was the SEC Offensive Player of the Week. And also we learned yesterday he is the Davey O'Brien National Quarterback of the Week. Great honor for Alabama's Bryce Young. Other sports that are busy on campus here at the University of Alabama and will be busy coming up this weekend, the Crimson Tide soccer team. They're at home all weekend tonight. They face TCU starting at 6 p.m. That match can be watched on the SEC ESPN Network. Sunday on SEC Network Plus on the ESPN app when they're home against UAB. Crimson Tide off to a 3-3 three three start. A couple of tough losses last weekend for the Crimson Tide. Samford and also on the road at Memphis. So West Hart's team hoping to get a victory tonight to move over 500 again. 3-3. Three three so far on the season. Crimson Tide volleyball team, they'll be busy once again. They had a Tuesday midweek matchup on the road in Georgia at Kennesaw State. Ended up losing that match in four sets, but we continue seeing Drew Cook really perform at a high level for Alabama. The libero has now been SEC Defensive Player of the Week back-to-back -back weeks to begin the volleyball season. So great work by Drew Cook. This weekend, Alabama once again on the road, traveling to San Marcos, Texas for the Bobcat Invitational. Texas State is the host of that tournament, and that's coming up on Friday. And then a matchup with the Miami Hurricanes coming up on Saturday. So two matches for Alabama volleyball coming up this weekend. And some other news around Crimson Tide Athletics. Men's basketball had a really tough piece of news earlier this week with the injury news that we learned from the Crimson Tide about Namari Burnett, a really talented transfer from Texas Tech. He is out for the season due to a knee injury. So really hard to see that news. Uh, we we're really excited to see Namari Burnett for the first time in Crimson. But that news came from the men's basketball team. Women's basketball team, you can make your plans for the full season now as we learned the non-conference schedule last week and then earlier this week the full 2021 SEC schedule was released so we do get to see all the games that Alabama will play in conference play starting on December 30th of this year at Tennessee but some great home games are coming up certainly can't wait to see Christy Curry's team back inside Coleman Coliseum. Alabama baseball, Brad Bohannon keeps recruiting. Baseball America says that Alabama has the eighth best recruiting class in the nation outstanding work done by Coach Bohannon, especially consider that a lot of prospects get a lot of looks from the Major League Baseball draft. He continues bringing in high-level athletes, and that will certainly help as the Crimson Tide keep building up the baseball team. And as I mentioned as well, a lot is new at Brian Denny Stadium this season. Just head to RollTide.com slash new in 21 to learn all about everything new at Brian Denny Stadium. Also looking at some COVID-19 protocols, making sure you have a health check, making sure you're not showing any symptoms, and then when you do come to the game, you will need a mask in indoor areas such as elevators, but once you're inside the seating bowl, you do not have to wear a mask, but certainly you can if you would like to. So those are the headlines, again, presented to us by R.J. Young, the official technology solutions provider of Crimson Drive. And we'll start this episode with Coach's checklist as Coach Saban met with the media last night as he tries to get his team and really the fan base focused for what's coming up on Saturday against Mercer. So we got every external factor in the world uh, that is affecting our ability to maintain intensity uh, and play the way we need to play and practice the way we need to practice to improve. 
Uh, we got the scoreboard affects us, uh, who we're playing affects us, uh, the heat affects us, the media and what you guys write every day affects us. So, you know, to me, we got to prove uh, that we can play and maintain intensity for 60 minutes in the game, execute, do our job, play hard, finish games, finish plays, do things the way we're supposed to do it. You know, I'm really excited about being able to play uh, at home this week. Uh, you know, it's great to be back in Bryant-Denny Stadium. It's great to have fans back. I think it's great for our players. I think it's great for our fans. Um, I'd like to congratulate all the guys on NFL rosters, having 70 guys on NFL rosters, uh, not all of which are active, uh, but 13 guys on NFL rosters from last year's team uh, is, you know, really significant accomplishment from a program standpoint, but also from an individual player standpoint. You know, guys creating value for themselves in their career here, learning what it takes to be successful on a consistent basis and now having an opportunity to fulfill their dreams is something that makes us very proud and very happy. Coach's checklist, head coach Nick Saban giving his thoughts to the media last night, and someone that was part of that press conference is Mike Rodak. He covers Alabama football for AL.com. Do such great work covering Alabama Crimson Tide football, and this is a segment we call Riders Row, where once a week we visit with an Alabama football beat reporter, somebody that's covering Alabama on a day-in, day-out basis, and this week we go to Mike Rodak again from AL.com. Mike, it's great to see you. How's everything going as we're only one week deep into the 2021 season? Yeah, it feels like we're already in, in the middle of things again. It's, it's a busy week around here, but that's, that's football season for you. It certainly is. Alabama started the season with a 44-13 win against Miami in Atlanta. For you, what were some questions on your mind entering the game, and did Alabama kind of answer any of those questions? Yeah, and I think the questions that were on my mind are probably the same that were on Nick Saban's mind. I mean, he was pretty open about it, that he didn't know how this offense would look with all the new faces along the offensive line and obviously a receiver, running back, quarterback. And it, it, I think it exceeded his expectations. I think it exceeded mine as well. I was expecting you know, them to ease into it a little bit more. And I think the first throw that Bryce Young had was deep down the field. And that, that sort of set the tone for, for how they felt about uh, some of the players out there and what they're capable of doing. And, you know, even though they didn't connect on that throw, obviously they, they were able to, to, you know, make that long touchdown later between uh, Bryce and, and Jamison Williams. So that was really the biggest takeaway for me was just seeing how quickly those guys were able to assimilate into this offensive system, which by the way, is a, a new offensive coordinator calling the plays and, and really a, almost an entirely new offensive staff as well. Um, so just to see all that come together and to score 44 points and, you know, four touchdowns from Bryce Young, the, you know, the most out of a quarterback in his debut, it's, I think that exceeded my expectations. And that was, that was the biggest thing that I saw. Yeah. With Bill O'Brien taking over as the offensive coordinator, you covered the tide under Steve Sarkeesian when he was offensive coordinator. Did you notice a lot of changes between Sark and coach O'Brien? Not necessarily. You know, I think that, you know, Sark actually mentioned in an interview a couple weeks ago that he actually changed some things between year one and year two with him. Um, and, and so I think obviously, as we all know, it's operating out of the same playbook, no matter who the coordinator is. And I think depending on who they have a quarterback and what, you know, their strengths might be at receiver and tight end and running back, that's kind of where they might choose the plays out of that playbook and, and what to do exactly. And I think the way Sark put it is, you know, they did a lot more of the RPO stuff under Tua his first year, and then they went more to the play action um, shotgun stuff with Mac his second year. And I think we saw a lot of that with Bryce. Um, but I think we'll see, especially going forward, trying to use Bryce's athleticism. Obviously, that's different than what I think Mac gave them. And, and Mac was athletic, probably more athletic than people give him credit for. But that was another big thing that stood out to me with Bryce was um, being able to avoid some of that pressure and, and very quickly, very quick twitch sort of athlete where uh, he could step out of the way and get into some open space, but also keep his eyes down the field. It wasn't as if he got some pressure and he tried to run immediately. I mean, he was getting pressure, going outside the pocket, but then throwing um, and throwing hard and throwing accurate. And that was, um, you know, one of the most impressive things for me. We figured John Metchie the third would be a familiar target. He obviously scored the first touchdown for the Crimson Tide, but Jamison Williams, how does he open up this offense? I mean, that's one 94 yard touchdown was one of the best we saw. Yeah, it's that speed. And, and they've been looking for it, obviously, to replace what they've lost the last couple of years and Henry Ruggs and Jalen Waddle, especially. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the new realities of college football. They have the opportunity to go out and, and get one of the fastest guys out there in Jamison Williams and have him play right away. And, um, 
you know, it seems like he's from, from the get-go is really impressing people around there. I think John Mechie even said it this week where it seemed like right away he was, he was fitting in and it seemed like he could do some big things early. So um, it's the speed with him. It's going to be the speed down the field. It gives him something different than what they have in, in John Mechie, who's fast, but he's not, you know, super fast track type burner. And obviously Slade Bolden being more of that slot guy gives him some different things for defenses to look at and kind of completes that picture. Uh, and, you know, I'd be interested to see too with Jamison, just how, I mean, he's, this is his third year. He's eligible for the draft after this year. I mean, he hasn't been a guy who's been talked about a whole lot up until now, but I can imagine if he keeps doing what he's doing, then uh, he's going to be a name that's going to get a lot of attention um, from NFL scouts. The offensive line was one area where we were all kind of wondering, what's it going to look like? We kept hearing about some of the injuries and mixing and matching uh, during fall camp, but what did you see out of that group on Saturday? Yeah, a little bit surprised to see Chris Owens at, at right tackle after we talked so much about the, the competition at center between him and Darian Dowcourt. Uh, obviously, Kendall Randolph still working his way back from that ankle injury, probably not uh, you know, 100% quite yet. Uh, was in the game a little bit as a, a tight end uh, blocker, though. So we'll have to see how they handle that going forward. It seems like they like what Dowcourt did. Um, on Saturday and you know maybe he stays in that role maybe Chris Owens goes into that that tight end role and they put Kendall Randolph at right tackle I think there's still some moving parts there but overall it seems like they did a pretty good job especially in the first half I know it it, like Nick Saban said it got a little sloppy you know as the game went on and um, you know some of those runs in the fourth quarter I think Miami knew exactly what Alabama was trying to do and you know it just wasn't really working out from an offensive standpoint but um, that's how it goes and there's obviously some room for improvement there Um, but I think Evan Neal, I think we all saw that, that highlight play where he knocked the guy over. Um, you think you're going to get a lot of those out of him this year. And they seem to really like what they have at guard too, in, uh, Eki and, uh, JV on Cohen. Defensively, what were your takeaways for Alabama? They were swarming. And that's, I think what we expected just a little bit, probably a higher tempo, a, a quicker off or quicker defense than what they had last year, just with so many faces that have been around um, and they know what they're doing and players who are really used to running in that scheme. It just seemed like they were really fast. Um, they they kind of knew what Miami was doing. They were getting after De'Ara King. He never seemed comfortable. You know, maybe it was partly the coming off the knee injury, but you just didn't really seem like he was all that uh, comfortable in the pocket and, and running around and able to get away from some of those uh, that pressure. So that's the biggest takeover for me. And I think, you know, Nick Saban mentioned it too, where, um, they had some of those defensive backs that, you know, they, they might be lost a couple battles here and there, Brian Branch giving up the touchdown. So, you know, that's, I think, to be expected at this point in the game. Those guys are still pretty young. But I think overall, as a secondary, they're probably, you know, a lot further along than they were at this point last year when you had four out of five new starters. So uh, very promising on defense. Obviously, the, the Chris Allen injury kind of throws a wrench into that. But when you recruit three five-star guys behind them, you know, it's just, you kind of, it's the next guy up and there's, there's some talent behind them. And, um, you know, as, as good of a player Chris Allen is, I think they're going to be all right at that position. Now the Crimson Tide at home for the first time this Saturday, welcoming in the Mercer Bears. What are the big storylines for you as we get closer to Saturday? Yeah, obviously it's a, it's a quirky offense. I, I think it's been talked about a little bit so far this week with the, the Joker position and kind of what they do that, you know, might be the wishbone or wing T, I think is the way it's been described. And, um, you know, it's going to be more of a, a front seven type of game where you're going to see more defensive linemen in the game. You know, typically Alabama is in this nickel package where there's only two down, you know, defensive linemen. I think we're going to see three of them in the game uh, a lot of this uh, this Saturday. So uh, it's going to be incumbent upon them just to keep the game um, in front of them. Keep, you know, I think back to the Citadel game, what was it three years ago, where it was just kind of a quirky start to that game. And so the Citadel was just running some things that just kind of caught Alabama off guard. And eventually they, they blew them out. But you just got to get used to what they have to do offensively. Um, so that will be part of it for them. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, offensively, I'm sure we'll see a little bit of Bryce Young, but just to see Paul Tyson in there, to see Jalen Miller, I'm sure we'll see, you know, quite a bit of them. And, um, you know, it's still, according to Nick Saban, a, a competition for that number two spot. So that's something to watch as well. Just going forward, if there ever was an injury to Bryce Young, who would be the guy that they feel more comfortable um, putting in there at quarterback? Oh, of course, you're a member of the Alabama media covering Coach Saban, so you know that he hates questions where you have to compare. But I'm not talking to Coach Saban. I'm talking to Mike Rodek at the moment. You've covered Nick Saban. You've also covered Bill Belichick before in your time when you were covering the New England Patriots. Just, you know, they're, we know they're good friends. They worked together before, very similar in a lot of ways. But any differences in covering those guys? 
Yeah, you know, I, I've always actually had more success asking Nick Saban about injuries than I did Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick just won't give you anything. And Nick Saban, I mean, he'll he'll give you some details. And I think he's he's willing to. Um, I don't know what the, the philosophy is in, in either case, you know, why they feel like they need to do it either way. But, um, you know, that, that's one of the differences. And, you know, I think um, for Bill, it's just he's, he's not going to give you much. It's just he kind of sits down and might give you a, a short opening statement and takes a few questions. We all know it's sort of that gruff demeanor when he's answering the questions. I think with Nick, it's more you, you sort of get a lesson. You know, those first two or three minutes of a press conference, it's almost like he's talking to his team about what they need to do and a lot of the, um, the psychological aspects of, of where they are. And it, it gives you some insight uh, that maybe you, you don't get um, just covering the Patriots where it's, it's kind of Fort Knox and you have no idea what they're thinking on a week to week basis. Well, you're covering Alabama for AL.com. You guys have a deep roster of really talented writers. Just what can you tell us about the coverage and what fans can expect when they log on each time? Yeah, exactly. We have Michael Casagrande and uh, our columnist, Joe Goodman. And another thing to, to look out for that's new is um, John Talty doing his SEC uh, newsletter each week that, that comes out on Thursdays. And uh, I think he really does a great job with that in, in terms of giving some inside information, not only about Alabama, but, you know, the other schools in the conference. And as we know, Alabama fans like to read about the other schools. They want to know what's going on at Auburn and LSU and all that. So that's a really good read. And I'll look out for it uh, on Thursday. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Look forward to seeing you in the press box at Brian Diddy Stadium on Saturday. Thanks again. You too. Thank you. Big thanks to Mike Rodak of AL.com for joining us. Make sure you catch his work following the Crimson Tide on AL.com. And yesterday he released an outstanding article on Trey Sanders, the great comeback that Trey has had. Of course, Crimson Tide running back that scored a touchdown in the Miami game, but also last year was in a very terrible car accident. He's had to really work hard to come back and play it all for the Crimson Tide, and he played extremely well against Monday. So make sure you check out or on Saturday against the Miami Hurricanes. Make sure you check that out in AL.com and Mike Rodak's cover of the Alabama Crimson Tide. It's Thursday. That means we're getting ready for another episode of Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show. It's coming your way tonight at 6.30 p.m. from Baumhauer's Victory Grill. And the host of that show, plus the voice of Alabama football on the radio, Eli Gold, joins us to preview Hey Coach. Eli, we had a lot of excitement last week for Coach Saban joining us for the first time. Now it's a home game weekend. That's always a special first Hey Coach show. It is. It's always nice. There'll be a lot of folks in town, hopefully, and... Uh... I don't know how many will necessarily arrive on Thursday, but for big games, they do. And I know every game is a big game, but we'll see how many folks are there later today. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's good to, to get to Bryant-Denny Stadium. It's good to have a, a nice crowd. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, regardless of the opponent, uh, it's going to be a fun weekend. Last weekend certainly was fun for the Crimson Tide in Atlanta, a 44-13 win against Miami. Just what impressed you the most about Alabama last Saturday? Well, there were a lot of things. Uh, the one thing that really was a question in my mind was how was the offensive line going to do? Would they give Bryce and the wideouts and the running backs time to work? And heck, they would have given me time to work the way the way they were protecting. Uh, that was exciting and, and good to see. It was nice to see Jamison Williams and his debut. It was nice to see Cameron Latu and how well he did catching a couple of touchdown passes. So, you know, everybody seemed to have a different idea of how the game was going to go. There were some who figured it was going to be a blowout. On Alabama's part, there were others who thought it was going to be a much tighter game. And I'll be honest, I thought that way. I thought it was going to be a fairly tight game because you just don't know. Uh, week one, uh, the first start for Bryce, there were so many questions. But as it turned out, uh, it was uh, quite the ball game. And uh, a lot of guys really showed what they're all about. Yeah, starting with Bryce Young, a pretty successful debut with four touchdown passes, and he just seemed composed the entire time he was out there. He did. Uh, you know, he, the guy is sharp, and, and you could tell in practice and at the scrimmages that, that he got it, that he knew what was going on. But again, with a full house first time, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, it could have been a little different. But no, he did very, very well, and uh, it was nice to see. It was a very encouraging performance uh, especially as you look down the road not only 
for this weekend's game against Mercer, but next week going to Gainesville and so on. Uh, it was nice to see him in a pressure situation and see him step up and do well. Now he gets to be a starting quarterback at Bryant-Denny Stadium for the first time when Alabama takes on the Mercer Bears. And in your research for the game, just what have you learned so far about Mercer? They're coming off a pretty nice 69 nothing win. They are. They, they played Point University, and, and they posted some uh, very gaudy numbers. Of course, Point is an NAIA school, so it's different, difficult to really make any comparisons. Uh, but last year... They played three nationally ranked teams, talking of Mercer, of course. They played three nationally ranked teams in the football championship subdivision, the FCS, and they beat all three of them, three nationally ranked teams, uh, and they beat all three. So, you know, they've got some good returnees. Uh, I'm not going to try and tell our viewers that, you know, they are, you know, an Alabama caliber team or a Miami caliber team uh, because they're not. But at the same time, they do have a very unique style of offense, very much one of those wishbone wing tee, a little of this, a little of that kind of offenses. So uh, it's not going to be an easy game. It takes some preparation. It's a game that obviously Alabama should win, but at the same time, uh, You know, anytime you, I remember a few years ago when Alabama played Georgia Southern and they had this kind of a, of an offense and they put more yards on the board and more points on the board against Alabama than darn near anybody else did that season. So it's, it's, it's a game Bama should win certainly, but uh, it's, it's going to take a little work. It really will. We had a good time on our Tuesday show with the voice of the Mercer Bears, Rick Cameron, talking about their unique offense and the fact that on their depth chart, they have positions called jokers. And usually if you're saying joker in the broadcast booth, you're talking about Butch Owens, Tom's type. It's going to be <laughs> fun for you, I'm sure, to say that yeah. on the broadcast and have that on your spotting board. <laughs> yeah, and, and they, of course, you know, use different guys last week. Their leading rusher was a linebacker, uh, a guy by the name of Pollock who, uh, you know, he was, it was strange. I was putting together my depth chart on uh, Tuesday and I'm looking and he's not on the depth chart as a running back anywhere. And I'm saying to myself, goodness, maybe he got hurt. I mean, I didn't know. So I go to the newspaper in Macon And there was nothing about him getting hurt. And I checked the game notes and there was nothing about him getting hurt. So I finally called their sports information director and I said, how is it the guy rushes for 111 yards? He's your leading ground gainer. And he's not even on this week's depth chart. Well, he's really a linebacker. And, you know, we were up so big, we started using everybody at different positions, just giving him a chance to have fun. So it's one of those teams, you know, it's, it's, it's a different approach, but yeah, those, those wing T those wishbones, those, those kind of offenses, it's tough to follow the football too. I don't mind telling you, I, I, I personally dislike these kind of games when you face a team that runs that offense, because uh, you really have to work extra hard to follow the football because they have all sorts of movement and razzle dazzle and so on. Well, we're getting ready for Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show. Obviously, Coach Saban joining us at 7 o'clock. What else is coming up on the show from Bomb Powers? Well, we've got Jordan Rogers joining us as the uh, media guest. He'll be part of the SEC Network broadcast team uh, for Saturday, working with Tom Hart, so he'll be in. And uh, Coach Waters is going to be with us, talking cross-country, track and field, uh, as that season gets cranked up. So, uh, as always, it's a lot of fun. We, we have a great crowd, and uh, I assume that later today will be no exception. We'll have a, a very good crowd. So, folks, if you're in the area, I mean, certainly you can tune in on our uh, Facebook Live feed uh, on the University of Alabama Athletics page. But uh, if not, if you're in Tuscaloosa, come on by and join us and grab some food. Baumhauer Bob has got some great new menu items that they have been rolling out here. If you like the Nashville hot chicken, they've got a, a version of that. They've got chicken etouffee 
and something I try that I really love. It's a uh, it's a fish uh, dish. He calls it go fish, G E A U X. Go fish. It's a bed of white rice, piece of fish, some shrimp etouffee on top of that. It's really very very good. So if you folks are in the Tuscaloosa area tonight or any time, you swing by Baumhauer's and uh, come join us for the show. Getting hungry just now. I want to end the show and get over there, but there looking go. forward to it. Uh, Eli, it should be another great edition of Hey Coach and the Nick Saban Show. Just thanks for joining us on Crimson Drive, and we'll see you later on. Roll Tide. It's a pleasure. And of course, coming on the air 12 noon Saturday, the Tide and the Mercer Bears. So again, Hey Coach is coming up tonight from Baumhauer's Victory Grill here in Tuscaloosa. As Eli, as you mentioned, will be joined first by Dan Waters. We'll have our special media guest coming up, Jordan Rogers of the SEC Network, as well as Coach Saban joining us at 7 o'clock for the next Saban show. So hopefully you can come on down and enjoy that or watch it online as we'll be sharing it here on our page, but also available on Alabama Athletics Facebook page as well to view Hey Coach and the Nick Saban show. Before we go on this edition of Crimson Drive, we want to take a look Look back to yesterday and once a month we're joined by the director of athletics Greg Byrne to get his thoughts on a variety of topics and this was our first visit of the school year we had so much to catch up on as we kind of look back at the last summer that was busy in college athletics plus look ahead to what's coming up for Alabama athletics and so we with that we will give you this interview with Greg Byrne as he joined us yesterday here on the CTSN Facebook page. Welcome in, everyone, to this month's edition of Greg Byrne Live as we visit with the Director of Athletics for the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne. I'm Roger Hoover with the Crimson Tide Sports Network. And, Greg, it's been since May, late May, since we last talked. And sometimes month to month, not a lot changes around Alabama athletics or college athletics, but this has been a transformational summer. How's everything been for you the last few months? Well, yeah, certainly, uh, it certainly has been a transformational time. Roger, we've got a little bit of downtime in the summer. Uh, obviously, not having any teams compete, although you know now in the in today's world they're they're practicing and, and working out. Uh, I shouldn't say practicing, but they're working out throughout the throughout the year now, including the summer months. So you know we've still been had a chance to be around our student athletes, but yeah, with uh, obviously with name, image, and likeness coming on. Uh, the radar, the, the realities of uh, the, the expansion of the Southeastern Conference with the announcement about Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, obviously, we're still dealing with COVID um, and, uh, you know, it just many other things that are taking place in our industry. Uh, you know, it's it's it, there isn't a lot of idle time, that's for sure. But uh, I can tell you that I'm, you know, I tell our staff this, I tell our coaches this. I'm just really glad that we're at the University of Alabama navigating these times because, you uh, you know, there, there's there's not a university that's in better position to to hopefully make sure we manage this in the best possible way for our student athletes, for our coaches, our staff, our fans, and our program. Starting with name, image, and likeness that went into effect on July 1st, just have you been pleased with how Alabama athletes have handled it as well as athletics and kind of navigating these waters for the first time? Yeah, it's been uh, it, obviously. It's, I think the saying goes, you know, you're you're. Uh, flying the plane as you're building it or you're building the plane as you're flying it and uh and so that's been some of that uh but obviously we've seen the value that our student athletes have here at the university of alabama uh being on the stage uh you know there are there are a handful of them that have signed some uh, pretty uh, lucrative agreements um you know the great majority of them are are more just you know instant mess or messaging on instagram or or facebook or twitter or, or snapchat about you know a local business or something along those lines um but it's uh it, it's something that's reality that uh you know i think it's a good opportunity for our student athletes uh I, you know i i do think you know i remember reading a deal one time where a, a reporter said you know you know the kids are going to make millions and millions off of this I, i'm not sure if that's reality but there are opportunities uh, for, for the individual to have some opportunities that, it, that they didn't have before. And we need to make sure we're on the forefront of that. I think we have been, but I think that will continue to, to adjust as time goes on. And then you mentioned as well SEC expansion, the news that Texas and Oklahoma were joining the SEC. Uh, on the athletic director level, were you kind of like everybody else absorbing that news as it came in? We know that Greg Sankey was involved along with SEC presidents, but where were you and your counterparts on that issue? Well, our, our, obviously, we got great leadership with with Greg and his staff, Greg Sankey and his his staff, and then uh, our presidents and chancellors, as well as you know, at the athletic director and SWA level and faculty reps and everybody. Uh, so you know, 
you always talk about potential scenarios, but you know, I, I can say that, uh, that that's something as, as that news was coming across, we were, we were kind of getting up to date at each of those times on, on what was taking place. And obviously as we saw the news knew that this made a lot of sense for our conference. Um, and I, you know, I, I said this when, when everything was going on a few weeks ago, I said, listen, any of the other conferences would have, would have jumped at this opportunity. I think it says a lot about our conference that we were the ones that Texas and Oklahoma reached out to. Um, and, you know, and, and obviously those are institutions that want to have, have our wonderful academic institutions, but also want to compete at the highest levels athletically. And I think they're going to fit very well within the framework of the Southeastern conference. Um, and so that was something that, uh, you know, as, 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 as that information started to come and develop, we just, you know, obviously I'm going to be talking about it from an Alabama perspective, but I understand it was important for our league to continue to position itself for the long term uh, adjustments and everything that's going on in college athletics. And, and I was very pleased to see it happen. Also with this summer, you mentioned it as well, uh, managing the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was something new for us last year, trying to figure out how to have a school year, an athletic year with the pandemic. In what ways is it different now that so many of your athletes are vaccinated, coaches, staff are vaccinated? What are some differences between last fall and now that we are at this point where there are so many vaccinated? Yeah, obviously the vaccine has been a, been a difference maker for us. Uh, Coach Saban's been public about 99.5% of our football program coach program coaches and staff are vaccinated. Um, our department, we, uh, we're, we're over 92% now. Uh, and that our, our, our teams that have the highest vaccination rates, you know, knock on wood, have had the least amount of issues. And, and all, you have to, it, I, I sent a tweet out about it a few, a week or so ago. We're basically, I think the national is, uh, the national stats show that if you're not vaccinated, you're five times more likely to get COVID than if you are vaccinated. Our stats are right there. six times more likely to get COVID amongst our, our student athletes, coaches, and staff. Uh, we haven't had any hospitalizations uh, for anybody that's been vaccinated in any manner, really. You know, we've been fortunate overall with that across the board. Um, but it's something that, uh, you know, I, I think the data shows you that this is the this is a good thing uh people are some people are starting to get boosters uh and and you know one of the things we try really hard is not to be political in any manner um but just talk to our medical folks and say okay tell us tell us what you say as medical experts and let us they're going to be the ones that are going to guide us through this they uh, dr robinson jeff allen uh, all of our other docs and trainers, they've done such a remarkable job serving our department, our student athletes through this and our coaches. And, uh, you know, and they, they, they have absolutely said that, that the vaccination is the right thing to do. So we've tried to talk about that without wearing people out about it. And, and I've, I've had some people tell me that they appreciated uh, our stance on that. And, and so we feel, we feel good about that. So the vaccine has been the biggest difference between a year ago and right now. Um, and, but we are still saying, hey, we got to be cautious. Uh, we got to, you know, there's a mass mandate on our campus and, and indoor places. Um, we, we adhere to that here within our department and uh, we'll, we'll continue to until, uh, until the mass mandate's not there any longer. I guess, you know, Roger, as the, as the head of the department, just what I've tried to do is, you know, it, what we try to do the entire time, respect the virus, respect one another and do everything we can to move forward safely. And that's worked well for us. And, and we're still trying to do, you know, take that same approach. And as we enter into the first week of having a home game at Bryant-Denny Stadium, looking forward to full capacity, what can you tell us about some COVID-19 measures that are in place? You did mention the mask mandate that is in place. So what does that look like for fans on game day? Yeah, so obviously the mask mandates for indoor spaces, uh, not out, not outside. Um, we, uh, and so that, that still exists. We're so, you know, we have electronic ticketing now, which, um, I, I want to strongly encourage, please don't wait till you walk up to the gate to download your ticket, download your ticket in advance before you come in, um, and save it on your phone and then have it for you when you walk in as, uh, as a, you know, so to keep the line sped up, we're actually going to have, uh, new metal detectors that people are going to see, uh, they're, they're actually much more efficient. In getting people through, which actually helps us from a staffing standpoint, um, so that people will see that as well. You you can uh, there'll be directions on what what you what you uh, how how you handle that. 
uh, we are pleased that the water monsters are going to be back and we're going to man those and make sure we're doing everything we can to keep them sanitized. Uh, but that will help so people can bring their empty water bottle into the, into the stadium, you know, keep, get something like this. These stay cold for a long time. Um, and, uh, it's a great way to, great way to, you know, make sure you're staying cool. We all, you know, we're also putting out the awareness about wear a hat, um, Wear, you know, wear your sunscreen and, and do everything you can to protect yourself from the heat. I'm hoping that we'll have some cloud cover on Saturday, uh, but uh, we always know our first couple games at home can be can be a little warm. So we have those those things going on, and then we'll also have the cooling stations around the stadium uh, that there'll be maps for those, so you know people can go get in front of uh, some misting fans and have a chance to, to cool down during during times during they're in the stadium as well. It's just great to have full capacity once again. What did it mean to you to be in Atlanta and see all the fans that were there for Alabama against Miami? And then just how excited are you to see Brian Denny when it's roaring once again? I think one of the greatest difference makers for us as a university is the passion of our fan base. And any chance we have to get people together, to have opportunities, to have you know, a sense of community, uh, a sense of togetherness, I think is, is a healthy thing for us. You know, we still want um, – want to have people be respectful of one another and and at the same time too you know part of college sports making it so special is is full stadiums and great crowds and you know we've seen it we've seen it during the baseball season this year uh they you know they major league baseball allowed uh it looks like full attendance i think almost everywhere we saw it with the nba this year obviously we're seeing it the nfl and and then uh in college football as well and uh you know that's something i think well, let's celebrate it. Uh, you know, I know, I think we've had a good turnout for our anticipated student crowd this week. And, uh, you know, just a chance for people to come out and celebrate outside the, the Alabama Crimson Tide and watch our watch our wonderful team uh, play. That's that's something that uh, I think anybody that that uh, puts on a, a script day shirt is will be excited about be, to be a part of. Absolutely. Really thrilled about football again. A great win in Atlanta against the Miami Hurricanes on Saturday. But also, you got to be thrilled that soccer, volleyball, and cross country off to really good starts as well with fall sports. Yeah, we're off and going with with that. It's a busy time of year for all of our sports. And, you know, I know our winter sports are right around the corner, too. And they're, they're working out and trying to get ready, too. So it's it's fun to see everybody competing and and, and moving forward certainly is. And if you've been asking Coach Oates if you can go on that retreat that the men's basketball team goes on in West Alabama, that military-style training to get ready for the season? I'm in decent shape, Roger. Uh, <laughs> but, man, I don't know. Uh, that, that That's a lot right there. I think I'll stick more to my uh, to my walking and, and push-ups and lifting some weights here and there. I think that, uh, that that's working pretty good for where I am at in my life right now. <laughs> Certainly understand that. Uh, as we get ready for, uh, of course, uh, you mentioned all the fall sports that are underway. We're getting ready for the winter sports. Kind of what's next on your plate? What's your focus going to be the next few weeks? Well, obviously, you know, making sure we're supporting all of our student athletes across the board, academically, athletically, and socially. Um, you know, we're we are, uh, you know, we're going to be working a lot, getting uh, getting our fans to hopefully have a great experience at Bryant Denny Stadium. Uh, we have a uh, you know, we, we're working on starting to develop what phase two looks like for the Crimson Standard. So some of that's ongoing as we speak. Had had a few meetings about that yesterday and trying to have some ongoing fundraising conversations, too. Um, so those things are obviously uh, for on the forefront of, of what we're dealing with on a daily basis. But, you know, anytime you have 600, 600 plus student athletes, you have 350 employees. Uh, there's never a dull day. There's always plenty, plenty on your plate to, to try to navigate and, and move forward with. So uh, I'm just glad we're, uh, I'm glad we're having an opportunity to do that with a, a bit more of a regular campus this year, but understanding still we have COVID that we're dealing with and trying to maneuver those waters the best we can as well. Well, Greg, we're off and running for a new school year and new athletic year at the University of Alabama. Just thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for spending some time with us uh, each month coming up on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. We always appreciate it and look forward to it. Roll Tide. The, roll Tide. Thanks, Roger. And look forward to seeing everybody at Bryant Denny this Saturday. Absolutely. That's the Director of Athletics for the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne. This has been Roger Hoover saying thank you for watching the Crimson Tide Sports Network. 
Great conversation with the director of athletics for the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne, and he mentioned it. I'll mention it as well. This is going to be your best friend on game day. Make sure you go and make sure you download your tickets now. Also, download your parking now. You don't want to be waiting around for any of that on game day, especially once you're in line trying to get inside Brian Davis Stadium, but that would be the worst thing as well if you're trying to get into a parking lot and you're having to take a lot of time to download the parking pass. Make sure you go ahead and do that well before you arrive on campus on game day as we get ready for a great game day experience coming up on Saturday between Alabama and Mercer. And again, to go, you can go online and go to rolltide.com slash new in 21 to find everything you need to know about the game day experience coming up for Alabama football games. That's coming up on our weekend schedules. We'll go ahead and take a look at what is ahead here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network over the next few days as we continue to cover Alabama football and Alabama athletics. Well, coming up on the network tonight, we already had our preview with Eli Gold, but hey, coach, in the Nick Saban Show, live from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Tuscaloosa, starting at 6.30 across all of our radio affiliates as well as online on the Alabama Athletics Facebook page. We'll be sharing that here as well on the CTSN Facebook page. Saturday, our coverage between Alabama and Mercer is coming up starting at noon and then kickoff at 3 o'clock. Make sure you also watch the booth cam presented by Royal Furniture right back here on our CTSN Facebook page. And then on Sunday, make sure you check your local affiliate to watch the Nick Saban Show presented by TruckWorks, hosted by Chris Stewart. Coach Saban will be along to break down the Mercer game and also give thoughts on Alabama football. That's also available on demand on RollTide.com and on the Athletics YouTube channel. Monday, we will be back with Crimson Tide Rewind at 6 p.m. from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Vestavia Hills. As Eli Gold will break down the Mercer game along with former Crimson Tide linebacker, Corey Reamer, and that'll also be streamed live right back here on the CTSN Facebook page. And then it's not on the schedule, but don't forget, next Tuesday we'll be back with another edition of Crimson Drive. We'll also be back next Thursday at 2 o'clock with an edition of Crimson Drive as next week we'll be looking ahead to the Florida Gators. But right now, let's just enjoy the fact that we're getting ready for Alabama's first home football game of the season, and it's the first time since 2019 where Alabama will have full capacity inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. We're just thrilled to be back here in Tuscaloosa getting ready for Crimson Tide football, and we certainly thank you for watching this edition of Crimson Drive presented by Coca-Cola. Big thank you as well to Mike Rodak of AL com for joining us greg burn the director of athletics plus eli gold thanks as well to producer extraordinaire ethan carabin putting all of this together and we just thank you again for watching this edition of crimson drive so much to look forward to this weekend just be safe and enjoy some alabama football roll tide everyone